Welcome everyone uh, from the World Investment Forum to this session on uh, investment in natural capital, um, where we hope to explore some of the dimension of biodiversity, which is often the other side of the coin, if you will, to climate and climate finance, uh, but often lives in the, the shadow of climate. So we hope to increase the awareness uh, of what is going on in this space uh, and understanding of what uh, financial institutions are doing this space, the opportunities, the risks uh, to potentially systemic risks to marketplaces, uh, and also what is going on on the reporting front and so on. So I don't want to go into too much detail, but we've got an excellent uh, panel with us today. Um, and to moderate this panel is our friend Peter from Planet Tracker. So this is a joint event between the SSE and Planet Tracker, and we look forward to collaborating with them in the future in this space. Peter, the floor is yours. Thanks very much indeed, Anthony, and uh, welcome everybody to, uh, to this, this panel session entitled Sustainable Investment and uh, Natural Capital. Um, Terminology is uh, always a challenge in, in this area, I think. So uh, from my perspective, I think if we're, if we're talking about nature or natural capital, I, I regard those broadly as synonymous. I think if, uh, if you're a te technician in this area, I'm sure we can, we can sort of parse some difference between those two things. Um, but in terms of the discussion today, I think we'll be sort of talking about nature and natural capital uh, interchangeably. And you'll probably hear the phrase biodiversity thrown around quite a lot as well. Um, biodiversity clearly a sort of a, a, a measure of, if you like, the, the quality of, uh, of, of the natural capital uh, asset that you're looking at, the nature sort of world that you're looking at. Uh, and again, I think uh, we should probably regard that as sort of synonymous with what we're talking about. And in essence, what we want to debate today is to, to have a look at the role of the financial markets and to really begin to, to sort of dig into a little bit more what can be done to bring the financial markets to a, to a point of greater awareness um, of the risks to, to nature, of the risks to natural capital, and also the opportunities uh, that potentially also lie in terms of really embedding uh, nature and natural capital risks into investment processes, uh, and the consequences if we don't. And we're all very aware of the climate debate going on at the moment, and I think one of the things that we would be very keen through this panel discussion is to really bring nature uh, very much to the fore uh, alongside climate and, and to think about those two things uh, completely interchangeably. Now, I'm very pri privileged to have a, a wonderful uh, group of panelists with me today. Um, so uh, I'll quickly go around, uh, go around the panel and, um, and then maybe they can, they'll be able to say a little bit more about what they're doing uh, individually. But we're, we're delighted to have Stefan Bujna, the CEO of Euronext Group. Um, we've got Simon Zadek, the Chair of uh, Finance for Biodiversity Initiative, uh, Odile Conchou uh, from the UNCDD, the Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, and Siobhan Cleary, who's a, a Senior Specialist at the, uh, the UNSSE, the uh, Sustainable Stock Exchange uh, Initiative. So I'm delighted to have you all uh, with us today. And, and I guess the question that, that I wanted to sort of uh, just throw out to, to the audience at the start um, is one that's been asked uh, to me a number of times, which is, you know, why do we, why do the financial markets need to be concerned about nature? And I was thinking about this as we were preparing for this panel discussion, uh, and it did strike me that's frankly an incredibly stupid question in many ways. And, and only a group of sort of, you know, people embedded into uh, to something as isolated potentially from reality as the financial markets would actually ask the question, uh, why do we need to be concerned about nature? Because quite clearly, uh, if the air that we breathe is, is not going to sustain life, then we will be um, amongst the species that become extinct. And that sounds like a, a fairly negative outcome for humanity uh, globally, but also for each one of us personally. Nature is clearly absolutely essential. Uh, to our lives and our quality of lives and the quality of the relationships, the quality of existence that we're able to have. But if you want to put it in a slightly more financial context and perhaps take it away from what, what might seem a, a little bit tree-huggy and not very financial markets, just imagine an asset owner who is managing a, a portfolio for a retirement plan, typical 30-year-old now, uh, let's imagine they're gonna work for another 30 years until they're 60. Well, lo and behold, of course, that will take them right into 2050, which is clearly the target date that we're all talking about from a net zero perspective. So they will just be reaching retirement at the point when we are in theory, 
aiming for a planet where the temperature rise has been sort of limited to, to only one and a half degrees sort of on average around the place. And we're all agreed that that will be sort of okay, not necessarily as great as it is now, but it, it won't be disastrous. So we're trying to design a planet where our, our imaginary retiree is just gonna hit retirement when the planet is sort of okay, if we all really work hard. Now, of course, that retiree, uh, if they're going to have a, a good a long life uh, in line with sort of the top up and end of, of life expectancy, certainly in the developed world, they've got a reasonable chance of living till perhaps 100, uh, and that will take them to 2090. So the 40 years of their retirement will be in the state of the planet in whatever sort of state we manage to get it in by 2050. So suddenly it becomes really important if as an asset only you are designing your portfolio to sort of uh, extract the maximum profit irrespective of climate and, uh, and nature from your assets right now, you are going to be creating a planet uh, in which your retirement beneficiary will probably not want to live, might even in the worst case scenario, not be able to live. And that seems a fundamental breach of fiduciary duty. So perhaps that's a slightly more uh, financial markets way of, uh, of looking at the basic sort of question. Um, so what I'd like to do now is, is to go around each of the panelists and, and, and ask them to describe in a bit more detail uh, some specifics of what they're involved in and how it relates to uh, the financial markets and essentially what their sort of uh, their ask or their ambition is um, from financial market actors. So Stefan, perhaps I could, uh, could start with you. Um, so the Euronext group, I mean, you, you've recently announced a commitment to uh, drive solutions that develop the blue economy. Um, and, and I wondered if you could tell us a bit more about this and, and maybe why the focus on, on blue um, and, and, and what you're doing and, and, and where you see the path going from here. Yeah, um, the idea has always been to embark as many uh, team members and as many uh, stakeholders around this uh, concept of enabling sustainable finance. And what we found as a, a sort of uh, inclusive concept is the concept of uh, uh, ocean and seas, because the reality of European uh, economies is that uh, the most common factor between all the countries that are part of the Euronext uh, construct is a special relationship with seas and oceans. Uh, actually, you may know that uh, the first uh, companies to be created in the form of a listed company where a company is created to finance boats uh, to, to embark into uh, uh, colonial uh, uh, shipping and colonial uh, uh, trade uh, to, to bring furs from Canada and to bring wood from Brazil and to bring uh, this, uh, spices from, from, from India. Uh, so, um, uh, and, and when you look at, uh, at what has been a, a significant part of the growth of the countries we operate, it comes from, from sea. And, uh, and oceans. I mean, uh, uh, Oslo, we operate Oslo Bourse, VPNs, and uh, Norway is about Oslo and Bergen. We operate the uh, Euronext Amsterdam, which is all about Amsterdam and Rotterdam. Uh, Euronext Belgium is all about uh, the development of the port of Antwerpen. Uh, France is, uh, is Paris, yes, but it's also Bordeaux, Le Havre, and, and Marseille. Uh, Lisbon is Lisbon and Porto. Uh, Italy is uh, is Rome and Milan, but it's also Geneva, uh, Genova and 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 etc. And Dublin is uh, uh, in Ireland when Irish stock exchange is, is Dublin and Cork. Not to mention London when we have a strong team. So uh, this this is this is the bond, and and all the team members, all the stakeholders feel connected by uh, by this entry door into sustainable development. And even if people don't necessarily understand the details of the connection between uh, clean oceans and, and biodiversity and interaction with climate change, they feel good if they embark into actions that are directly related to oceans because of this special relationship. Uh, but the reality is also beyond history and uh, sort of a psychoanalytic relationship with the seas and oceans, you have a, a reality which is a, a significant part of the growth of, uh, of European economies is in uh, aquaculture and fishing, uh, in, uh, in maritime transports, in renewable energy, in maritime renewable energy, in maritime tourism or coast tourism, and uh, a, a significant part of the future of the growth of European economies depends on the quality of, uh, of the sea and the oceans uh, uh, along the line, along the shores. 
So um, there is also a vested interest in, in making sure that, that uh, all the efforts are activated to, to protect this, this component of, of the urban growth. So uh, we, we have embarked into a, a project to, to analyze the 162 blue economy companies listed on Euronext, uh, just to create a, a coral of relevant companies. Uh, they represent no more than 10% of the aggregate market capitalization of the group. But what we have observed is that for most of them, approximately 50% of them, they are somehow more advanced than other companies in, in terms of um, commitment uh, in, of, uh, of ESG nature, in particular climate change uh, commitments, carbon footprint reductions. So just as if the fact that you, you, you make your living by working on seas and oceans, uh, creates a stronger uh, appetite or awareness of, of working for the grand, great, greater scheme. So that's what we do. Uh, maybe we'll have more time to later on to discuss the type of specific products and initiatives we do, but that's that's the purpose. And, and that has translated in, in your next being one of the first signatory of the, uh, if not the first one on uh, signatory of the UN Global Compact Sustainable Ocean Principles. And, uh, and also uh, more recently signing the UN Global Compact Blue Board uh, reference paper and contributing to the, to the Blue Bond reference paper. So um, th this is why it is so natural for us. Thanks, Stefan, that's really helpful. And that's a, it's a, it's a really good illustration of, if you think about the blue economy, it's very easy to think about fishing, um, but actually as, as, as you've highlighted, it's, it's absolutely fundamental to, uh, well, a whole trading relationship all around the world and so many other things as well, including renewable power, of course, um, where, uh, where many of our uh, sort of offshore wind farms being sited clearly in the oceans and also looking at, uh, at sort of tidal wave power and things like that. So that's, that's really interesting. We'll come back to sort of uh, talk about some of those things um, a bit more detail as we go through the discussion. Um, but I wanted to sort of link to one thing that you were talking about in terms of the, the specific companies. You talked about 162 companies with a with a market cap of, uh, of 10%. And clearly one of the big debates going on at the moment is the extent to which companies are actually disclosing useful information to investors around their activities and how they are impacting nature uh, and acting in a nature positive or nature, nature negative way. Now we've seen a lot of disclosure over the years around the climate side of things and people are now very used to talking about carbon footprint and your path to net zero and uh, what sort of transition path where your company is on. Um, but I think the, uh, the disclosure regime around nature is, uh, is a lot more sort of nascent. Um, and Simon, I wanted to turn to you because I know that you've been very involved in, a, in an extremely important project called the, uh, the Task Force for Nature-Related Financial Disclosures. I, I always have to think very hard uh, to try and actually remember what the initials stand for. So we've got uh, TCFD on the carbon side, and now we've got TNFD uh, on the nature side. And I wonder if you could sort of tell us a bit more about that project, where it's got to now, um, and, and, where, and where you think it's actually sort of leading to, and the benefits that we're hoping that will come from it. Sure, Peter. Thanks very much indeed. And thanks to Planet Tracker, but also to the Sustainable Stock Exchange Initiative and UNCTAD for inviting us to contribute to this panel. So, uh, as you say, the TNFD is a bit of a mouthful, um, but is basically pricing nature in a more systematic way, such that corporates <clears throat> or projects can inform the financial community more effectively as to what the implications of nature dependencies and impacts are likely to be when you get around to asset valuation and allocation, which is ultimately uh, the game and play. Um, and the TNFD in some ways um, kind of builds on the shoulders of the TCFD um, but perhaps with a few important differences. And I'll spend a couple of minutes highlighting the differences by way of uh, explaining a little bit as to where TNFD is likely to go in the future. So TNFD is a collection uh, now of 35 market actors co-chaired by David Craig, who's recently set down as the CEO of Refinitiv, and Elizabeth Morema, who of course is the executive director of CBD, which Odile will come on to in a second. So there's the first difference, you know, which is that we have a co-leadership, if you like, from, you know, the biodiversity side and from the market. Uh, and that's not a nicety, but is in recognition of A, the complexity of nature compared to the carbon agenda, not the climate agenda, but the carbon agenda, 
that TCFD is in the main focused on. Uh, and secondly, to recognize the importance of interconnecting the way the market functions with broad-based uh, international agreements such as those that are being driven by CBD. And as I said, I'm sure Adil will touch on that in a second. Secondly, um, our approach to risk um, is both the same fundamentally, but a little bit different in an important way in that we include in our framing of risk um, a broad array of nature dependencies and impacts with a view that some of those may be material today already, according to our well-versed auditors and lawyers that tend to drive that agenda, um, but many dependencies and impacts that may not trigger their interest are likely to be material in the future. So just to illustrate the point, if tomorrow the Environment Bill in the UK goes through, which includes a new mandatory due diligence obligation on deforestation for the corporate community, not the financial community, but the corporate community, that will drive a linkage between deforestation impact in supply chains and materiality in financial institutions. So it will overnight shift the relationship in that particular domain of nature um, between one aspect of impact, irrespective of what the auditors and lawyers think, uh, and how the financial community needs to think about that aspect uh, of their lending and investment strategies. So a broader view of risk um, that ultimately allows one to build out, as has TCFD, um, that all important transition risk pathway. So not just looking today, but looking into the future. Um, the third part of the story, and in a sense, I've already made the point, is that it's taken the climate agenda, if you like, 15, 20 years to get into the liability space. Uh, and there's a long way to go, but we can already see the rule of law and financial regulation beginning to lock in very quickly and have significant impact in the way in which uh, asset valuations are being progressed. I think that's gonna happen with nature much, much more quickly. Uh, we see the central banking community coming quickly to the table uh, in beginning to think about the place of biodiversity in the way in which they think about their job. So financial stability, uh, investor probity, uh, efficient and fair markets, transparency, so on and so on and so forth board capabilities. Um, and that took 10 years uh, for the climate agenda, and it's taken so far 10 months for the nature agenda. Uh, and we see a range of different liability aspects for the simple reason that it's never the law, you know, it's not against the law to emit carbon, even though it's wrecking our lives, but it is against the law to wreck a lot of nature. Yeah. And so the basic rule of law will have many additional aspects as it evolves in particular that will need to be taken into account. So that, you know, all of which is building on TCFD uh, and the way in which that's evolved, but in a sense, extending also beyond it. Two other pieces, and then I'll hand it back to you, Peter. Firstly, it is the TNFD disclosure, but actually disclosure, whilst by no means over, is only one way in which the financial community learns about risks and opportunities across the business community. And increasingly, in a digital world, it is a reducing importance way of doing so. And so although we are TNFD, in fact, we're having to take account of the high complexity data ecosystem within which we can begin to understand nature and following the puck to where it's going to be rather than where it is today, imagining what that ecosystem is likely to look like in five years or more. Where disclosure will be important, of course, and regulated in critical ways, but will only be one source of information for the, for the financial community about nature-related risks and, of course, upside uh, opportunities. And, and then the final piece I, I, I guess I would mention you know, is that TCFD is not the task force on carbon-related financial disclosure. It is the task force on climate-related financial disclosure. But there has been a very significant focus on the carbon and mitigation agenda, particularly in the construction of 1.5 degree scenarios as a basis for looking at transition risk pathways. 
uh, I think as TCFD extends and begins to look at the broader array of climate related issues for the business and financial community, actually it becomes more and more about nature. Yeah, and so actually TNFD is not simply a complement to TCFD, but there will be really important overlap and integration of their agendas as we move forward. And we need to make sure that that's not just not in the science space, but is in the way in which we manage as a financial and business community risk itself. Thank you, Simon. That was a really, uh, really helpful um, framing of, of the, the TNFD. And, and actually you touched on some, some really important um, broader points as well. I, I think the point that you made about, you know, it is already illegal to harm nature in, in some very key respects is a really, really interesting one. Um, and, and one that I think is, is perhaps not thought about carefully enough by many financial institutions, companies operating sort of directly exposed to that tend to think about it quite carefully, at least they should be, and oftentimes they do. Um, but it's something the financial markets have, uh, have not really thought about as much. And, and I think that's a really good point. And, and that other issue, again, we'll, we'll come back to this in the discussion, but the, the gradual coming together of, of these sort of two sides of what is essentially the same debate, how do we actually manage our economy in a way that makes our planet sort of great for us all to live in rather than just somewhere where we're surviving in our sort of very expensive uh, climate managed bubbles uh, that that's a really important issue to see those two things coming together but deal if i can turn to you I and mean, simon uh, mentioned already um the, the very strong link uh, between the cbd uh, and the tnfd um, and, and clearly this, this sort of um, issue of biodiversity. So now we need to sort of, you know, again, narrow down the terminology and, and perhaps you could uh, explain a little bit more um, about what, what it is that, uh, that you're doing with the Convention on Biological Diversity and, and, and how you really want that to impact the financial markets and, um, and maybe explain why uh, your part of the organization has been so keen to be involved in TNFD as well. It'd be really helpful. Thank you, Peter, and uh, thank you also to to invite me to to participate to this really uh, really interesting panel and discussion today. So uh, I'm I'm part of the CBD Secretariat of the CBD Convention on Biological Diversity, as as you said, and the, the Secretariat of the CBD is in charge of organizing and uh, the, the COP15 in China. You know the COP15 in China. We had the first part last week, and we'll have the last the second part in uh, in April May next year uh, next year because of uh, of the COVID crisis. Uh, everything has been postponed. But what is important to say is that the COP15 in China is as important as the COP21 for climate wars because it will define the next framework, the post-2020 global biodiversity framework that will be hopefully adopted in uh, next year and that will be as important and uh, equivalent of, as, um, of the Paris Agreement adopted some years ago for climate. So it's really a huge and important step in terms of biodiversity. We say perhaps more biodiversity on the CBD side, but biodiversity and nature are mixed. So it's, it's an important uh, moment uh, because it will define this framework for the next 10 years. And it has to be defined closely and linked with, uh, with the climate also work and, uh, and with the COP26 arriving in, in two weeks now. And why, why is it important for, for the financial sector? It's become once, for, first of all, that's a global overarching policy. Uh, and secondly, uh, once adopted, it will be translated into policies, regulation at regional and national levels. And that means that it will have direct consequences on the operation of companies and financial entities. Look at what happened uh, lastly in France with Article 29, very famous one on the energy law requiring uh, companies and financial institutions to disclose what they are, report and disclose what they are doing in terms of bio diversity without concretely having the good methodology now on the table to do that but that's a challenge that they, they decided to do so imagine every country is doing the same because of the uh, gbf and uh, and the translation in their national policies and uh, the financial sector will understand very quick that they have to do to do that which is important also to say is that uh, this, um, this GBF requires or will require also and certainly the revision of the 
and BSAPs. And BSAPs, that's the uh, equivalent of NDCs for climate, so the, the national concretely the national um, strategy on biodiversity and as they should be um, supported by national biodiversity financial plan how to finance the biodiversity locally and what would be and will be absolutely important is that it will be developed by the ministries of environment sure but with other ministries including the ministries of finance and also with external partners as local um, financial institution and why not international ones because in a lot of countries and above all in developing countries they are they are really important and that's what we are pushing and uh, and also pushing these ideas of uh, the fact that all financial flows should be aligned with with that. So uh, for that we we are now working closely with the financial sector, uh, which is I have to say quite new at the CBD. That wasn't the case before. And uh, as several actors and Elizabeth Prem as the first says, we have to build on on our heroes, if I can say, and to and to work with all the partners involved in this uh, biodiversity crisis. And the financial sector has really really an important role to play, because if I can say like things as they are the financial sector is financing everyone <laughs> and uh, the business the government the local entities and so on and has a real power to make things change before cbd i was working in a public development bank the french one and i can and yes that's true you you have the power to to make things evolve when you are providing money to the others so that's the role of the financial institutions in helping and pushing their client to evolve and to make this necessary ecological transition is absolutely huge. And uh, they have also to make this uh, internally, this, uh, this, uh, this transition. So that's why we are now working with the financial sector in order to, to, to push and to support them to, uh, to be part of this process first uh, of the definition and design of the GBF. And we are really, really happy to see some uh, group of financial institutions uh, being uh, observers in these uh, events and able to speak. That wasn't the case before. And also uh, thinking about how to implement. And there has been a lot of commitments made last week as the first part of the COP15 in China. Uh, from, uh, um, for example, Finance for Biodiversity Pledge, uh, now 75 uh, inst financial institutions, and also the creation of two other groups of financial institutions, either Chinese one or with also international other banks. So we, we see that it's really evolving alongside what the business is doing, perhaps for more longer time. I would just, regarding your, your question, um, why is it important for, for us? And perhaps before I forget, <laughs> yes, um, th this work with the financial sector, a lot of working groups and so on, um, make us come to, to the TNFT. Uh, we and Elizabeth and Mama was asked to, to co-chair that, and it has been really seen as a wonderful link between what the CBD is doing with this global uh, framework and the way to implement and achieve that with the financial sector, mainly the private financial sector, because that's the aim of the TNFD, but also it will be linked with the public financial sector with a specific hub internally in the TNFD. So that's a real uh, wonderful <laughs> uh, way to, to link these two, these two sides of the coin, uh, as you said. Perhaps if I may come back to why it's important for the financial sector, I would say something has to, to be uh, really clear. Uh, nature or biodiversity, it's not only about plants, animals, and so what, why would a, a bank uh, protect a panda, for example? That's really nice. But finally, as you said in the introduction, the problem is perhaps not there as a problem it's about people and it's about our need for food security medicine fresh air pure water carbon sequestration coastal protection and so on and so on that means the ecosystem services that are provided for free now to us by ecosystems that are a normal march wetlands coral reef forest agro-systems also and that has to be understood they are providing us services which are free 
we consider them on the ecological side as natural infrastructures, developing services for us, and they are named, as you said, in the financial world as assets, natural assets or natural capital assets, as you said in the in the uh, in the opening. And that is why it's important because of the services provided to us, because of the of the value also that they have. It has been uh, estimated by OECD as uh, 125 trillion per year, 1.5 times uh, global GDP. So I think with such figures, there are a lot, but uh, uh, it's easy to understand the, 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 the value and the importance for the economy of these services provided by nature. And if they collapse, businesses and, uh, and uh, financial institutions will be bad, if I may say that. <laughs> so that's perhaps uh, the most important things to, 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 to understand and to, and to deal with how to, um, how to protect and how to uh, finance either the protection, the restoration, or new projects positive with biodiversity, which is more or less. And it can be through managing the risks or through financing new project positive for biodiversity, which is what is behind this concept of aligning flows, the same concept uh, that was used in the Paris Agreement. And I won't come back to all the risk faced by the financial institutions because I think Simon developed that very well, and uh, and it's uh, and it's not useful to to come back to that. Perhaps just to say that you have the risk side, but you have also the opportunity side, which is for for a financial institution quite interesting. I was just before that in a, in a, in another event uh, dedicated to the insurance, and that's amazing to see what the insurance sector is now developing to insure, you know, uh, elef <laughs> elephants because they are fighting with people to insure wetlands, marshes. You couldn't imagine that. And above, and also for us, people from the, uh, from the biodiversity side that an insurance company would insure a march, a simple march <laughs> because of its role uh, against fluid uh, in, uh, in the future. And that's really, an impressive progress and it gives us a lot of hope. Thank you. Thanks, Adil. That's a, that's a fantastic sort of uh, introduction to the topic and a really clear um, presentation as to, as to just how integrated uh, finance is already becoming in, in the whole um, sort of um, CBD biodiversity effort and, and, the, and the framework of COP15, which I think is, is fantastically exciting because uh, as, as sort of Simon was alluding to earlier, it's it's taken a lot longer for the sort of the climate debate really to get traction in the financial mm -hmm. markets. And I think it's very exciting to see a much more rapid sort of pace of integration uh, between the sort of uh, the, the, if you like, the scientists and the people who understand planetary ecosystems. And, and then on the other side, the people who are actually pumping money into the economy and have, have the power to sort of do great good or, or to do great harm. But of course, part of that is, uh, is, is companies themselves and financial institutions um, having things that they can measure and, and having targets. And it's, it's often said, if you can't sort of measure it, you can't manage it. And certainly my experience of working for financial institutions is they love data and they love measuring things and they love targets, uh, not, not always uh, in the best way, but, um, but it's pretty essential to the function of any financial institution. And, and Siobhan, that's something that you're sort of uh, deeply involved in, I think, in terms of the science-based targets network. And I wondered if you could sort of expand on that a bit and uh, tell us a little bit more about the work that's going on there and, and, and how that sort of meshes with, uh, with what the other panelists have already discussed. Sure, thanks, Peter. And thank you, um, Anthony and Ong Chad for having us today. Um, so I guess the Science-Based Targets Network is another piece of the puzzle that we're busy building out here, which is that it, firstly, as an organization, we're a collection of more than 50 global NGOs, uh, scientists, sustainability experts, mission-driven organizations. And really what we're trying to do is develop the tools, methods, and guidance that companies and cities can use to set science-based targets. And by science-based targets, we mean targets that ensure that their activities remain within planetary boundaries and the concept of a just and equitable corridor. So, Really what we're saying is that it's not enough. I, I think what we've learned um, from the work of organizations like the Science-Based Targets Initiative is that you know, historically people would sort of set targets, but they weren't necessarily 
anchored to anything meaningful. And where we are now is a sort of an appreciation of the fact that in many of the areas we're operating in, in the nature space and in the climate space, the climate arguably is part of nature, um, we, we understand that there are limits beyond which we cannot go. And so how do we take that understanding of those limits and then translate that into something that individual actors can take meaningful action on. And that's essentially what the Science-Based Targets Network is in the process of developing. Um, the work is underway. Um, it's not um, complete yet, but it is, um, and my scientist colleagues tell me it will never be complete in some ways. It is always evolving. I choose to ignore that and focus on the, the things we can do now. But we've already identified, for example, a number of interim targets, things that that companies can already do now that set us on the right path, that are directionally correct. Um, obviously, setting a science-based climate target is one of those things that companies can do now, which is relevant in the context of nature as well. Um, but there are other nature-related targets in relation to land use, in relation to water use, in relation to ecosystems that companies can also set now. Um, how this overlaps with some of the other initiatives or intersects with some of the other initiatives we've already spoken about. Obviously the CBD and the outputs of the CBD process are critical input into the definition of the boundaries and the operating boundaries. So, you know, in the process of designing the work that we're doing at the moment, we're also having to make sure that we build in um, the, the expectations of what will come out of the process um, next year. We are also, obviously working or looking to work very closely with the TNFD because whilst we are focused our primary sort of proposition is the setting of targets the enabling of action um, in order to disclose and in order to set targets you need to be able to measure and understand your impacts you need to be able to prioritize where you're going to take action and regardless of whether you're reporting for TNFD purposes or reporting to enable people to monitor and verify that your science-based target is in fact a science-based target and that you are making progress against it, there are reporting components associated with both. And so obviously um, we want to ensure that we, we build on one another's work, we accelerate where it makes sense to do so, we align where it makes sense to do so, and, um, and collectively, we drive action um, as rapidly as possible because actually we're we're probably starting a few years late in, in terms of really moving as quickly as we need to do. Um, in relation to the sort of role of the finance sector, as I've said, our primary focus at the moment is target setting for companies and cities, um, sort of real economy actors as you were. But we see the finance sector as being absolutely critical as a lever for driving change. And so really what we want to get to is a point where the finance community um, understands that companies setting science-based targets is our best chance of getting to um, a, a livable world in 50 years time, 30 years time, rather than one which is, um, which is not livable. So the best business, a business case for not, um, not pushing us over the edge. So, so our focus with the finance community at the moment is really ensuring that they understand what the, the tools and methods are, but really helping them get to a point where they understand what good and credible action looks like in this area. And, and that's the work that we're doing with the finance community at the moment. I'll leave it there. Thanks, Siobhan. That's really, really helpful and, and, and actually sort of um, lines up with the next question that I was going to ask to uh, the, the panel generally. Um, and you mentioned, you know, the, the, the fundamental sort of focus of, of helping financial markets to understand what sort of, you know, good and credible actions uh, actually look like, which is a, which is a great way of framing it. And the question I was going to to throw open to to all of, of my fellow panelists is a very simple one, really. What what do we need to do? What do we need to do to mobilise the financial section, financial sector, to uh, to take action on on nature? So I think you know, Siobhan has already set out uh, a, a sort of part of that, but I, but I wondered whether others on the panel had, had ideas around what is it that we need to do going forward? We've discussed some of the sort of uh, the key initiatives that you're all involved in, but are there particular things that we could be doing um, that would sort of really uh, move things on? Simon, you, you're already waving a hand, please jump in, but uh, everybody else uh, do, do join. 
God, I didn't even notice I had, I was just playing with the buttons. Um, so, um, okay, so a couple of things uh, from my and our side. So let, let's start with the data and the communication. So there is a narrative emerging around nature that it's too complicated for now, so people should wait. And I can assure you, nothing can be further from the truth. Yeah, that there is absolutely no reason why any and every FI should not do a portfolio-wide nature stress test and to report on it, least of all to their board, most of all to the broader public and community. Uh, a top-down approach can suffice to kick off with uh, in looking at sensitive sectors and jurisdictions that struggle to uh, protect nature. Uh, and that will immediately draw out the hotspots, even without any project level data whatsoever. Uh, and, and so I think the starting point is right there, which is it can be done tomorrow. It really doesn't take that long. FB has demonstrated with existing publicly available data sets that one can get a first cut that's a good start. Uh, and really, we need to see more progress on that. So that would be number one. Number two, staying with TNFD for a second. Uh, one of the other slightly uh, interesting pieces about TNFD is whereas TCFD took nine months to bring out a consultation draft, we will issue a beta framework within 100 days. Yeah, and the reason for that is because we see the need to get into the market quickly for prototyping and experimentation piloting to be done with a sort of first generation framework. And we see instead of modeling TNFD as a standards organization that sort of a year in will do something and then later on will do something else, actually think of it more as a sort of open source software model yeah, where we put something out for prototyping yeah, we issue guidances, patches, more information as we go, and then crowd back in experience at scale uh, based on how people are using it. That's on the date, that's on the data and disclosure side. And then I would just make perhaps one uh, final observation, which is nature is complex, it influences everything. As you said, Peter, if it goes away, we all go away. In fact, we are nature. Um, however, um, just as energy is critical to climate and carbon, food is critical to nature. It's not the only sector of importance, but it's an $8 trillion part of a $90 trillion global economy with an estimated by the World Bank $12 trillion a year worth of negative externalities, a major part of which uh, is nature impacts. Yeah, and so, we should, we should hunker down on food and we should really focus on how the transformation in food is going to happen in a way that is rapid, uh, but is not disruptive since it's one thing to disrupt a coal-fired power station, but quite another thing to disrupt a global food chain. Uh, uh, and so we should really think about this through a sector lens as well as through a sort of broader nature and global economy lens, because an awful lot can be done in that, albeit very large, but narrow initial perspective. Thank you. That's really helpful. Yeah, and no, I completely agree with those points. I think your point about food is a really, really, really interesting one, actually. And as you say, one does need to be quite careful about the disruption that takes place in, in something as fundamental as that. So, Stefan, I wanted to just sort of, um, you know, direct the question a little bit more to, to you, if I may. And, in terms of financial institutions and indeed the companies themselves operating in the financial markets, clearly the stock exchange uh, on which they list or the stock exchanges on which they list are, are pretty fundamental in terms of driving requirements for disclosure, regulating the behaviour of companies and the participants in the market. I mean, what, what is it that Euronext is doing and, and, and what do you think that other sort of stock exchanges should be doing? Yeah. Maybe regard? before before uh, answering precisely your question, you know, Euronext, a few comments on what have been said before. The reason why we at Euronext are a strong believer of this commitment to biodiversity as nature is, is not because we have a special relationship with polar bears. Uh, it's because um, we believe that this is the most powerful gateway or entry point to the wider uh, commitment 
to, to global warming and to climate change. It's just that the reality is that, that uh, this is the only gateway to deliver tangible proof that responsible behavior is a must do, just because none of us on this call has ever touched uh, climate change consequences. You have to believe in science. You have to feel that it's hotter than usually. You have to feel that the confusion on uh, seasons not being what they used to be are there. But it's 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 global. It's average. It's blended. It's far away. You don't touch it. Whereas in our lifetime, in our local uh, environment, you can touch and feel and have a direct uh, perception of of biodiversity erosion. Therefore, embarking people into something they feel, they can touch, they can uh, conclude that it's true, is the best way to prompt uh, personal change in behaviors, collective change of attitudes and behaviors. And it's a very powerful tool. And, and that's, that's why we are, we are committed to that, because I would have never been able to embark the, all the Euronex teams on a sort of conceptual climate change, which has some aspects of a religion belief, although of a religious belief, although extremely well documented by science. Uh, whereas you can you can embark people into a special relationship with improving the environment of the water space next door. The second point I want to to uh, highlight about what has just been said is uh, about what what finance uh, can do, what we need to do. Uh, you know, I don't know whether finance is good or is bad. But what I know is that finance is a very, very powerful, probably one of the most powerful uh, uh, tool in the planet to, to send or share a lot of information very quickly, very far away to many people. And, uh, and that's, that's power, this power of dissemination of collective preferences is something which is really embedded in finance. Finance for the past 5,000 years or, or trade or exchanges are a way to, 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 to crystallize collective preferences. And, and in this respect, uh, this is what probably one of the most powerful, actually the transformation on, the, on ESG for the past 18 months where things have massively accelerated can be dated at the beginning of 2020 when uh, BlackRock, one of the largest, if not the largest asset manager in the planet, decided to, to commit that 100% of their funds will be ESG combined by the end of 21. And Amundi, which is the largest asset manager in Europe, did the same a few days before. So when those guys commit to such things, that has huge ramifications immediately. So what, among the things that are needed, uh, to take your, your previous question, I think there are three things that are very, very important and very powerful. The first one is the harmonization of standards. What people complain about, it's not, we, we don't have time to touch that, but it's clearly the, the, the sort of, um, of confusion that is created by the fact, because, because these standards are by essence political, they are non-financial standards, therefore they are, if they are not financial, they are political. Uh, they, they, the way they are structured is never neutral. So uh, the reluctance to have a bunch of accountants albeit very smart experience sitting in, in a glass tower and deciding what is uh, uh, green, what is brown, what is uh, uh, nature, what is uh, culture is a bit, uh, is a bit uh, weird. And, and, and we welcome any initiatives taken by uh, proper uh, politically driven international organizations that are uh, uh, governed by people who are elected by citizen as the right type of framework to do it. The second part is that in the pure accounting world, maybe efforts can be further developed because I believe that they are not really significant enough in the accounting front to better price scarcity. Because what we are talking about is, is pricing of scarcity. And pricing the scarcity of assets for which there is no market is probably the most complicated thing to do. And, uh, and work has started obviously with carbon pricing, etc. But if we want nature to become as powerful as carbon footprint, uh, I mean, some tools must be developed to to price that. Maybe I'm not I'm 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 pushing open doors and I'm ignorant. So if it is the case, I apologize because efforts have been done. But at least it did not reach the desk of of of, of companies. And the final point, which is not a small point, is to make sure that uh, companies in transition 
companies that are not where they should be, but are doing what needs to be done to be there, uh, are recognized for their best efforts, because otherwise you can't capture for, for ESG or for nature uh, a, a group of companies. You can't capture the GDP in 10 years on the basis of companies of today. Otherwise, there will be no success because there will be no liquidity. If you have this very small group of companies, who is going to invest in this very small group of unliquid companies? Uh, you need to find a way to bridge the gap with, 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 with uh, a sufficient large universe for investment, uh, including the ones that are making debits, which is then moving into a very uh, ambiguous uh, um, um, judgment call. Uh, final point on, on what we do at Euronext, but I wanted to keep the, the advertising part short. Uh, uh, we, we, we believe that we should do what, what exchanges do for a few hundred years, which is to provide visibility and transparency. We make companies that are making the relevant effort more visible because investors, you know, for, for, for 300 or 400 years, uh, what we do is that we fix the problems of the people who have too much money and, and are looking for, for IDs to, to invest because they want yield. So these are investors. And to fix the problem of the people who don't have enough money, who are uh, the people with IDs but no resources. So for years and years and years, people wanted yield, capital gains, liquidity, performance. Now they tell us we want yield, capital gains, preferences, but also we want a contribution to the environment, a contribution to society, and a transparent and diverse governance. So show us projects that do that. And the, pro the companies that do that tell us what should we do to be more visible to the ones who are bringing money. And that's a very fundamental point for years, for the past, let's say 10 years, ESG and, and tomorrow to a larger extent nature investment was a way to diversify your investor base, to approach to address. Now, it's not anymore a question of diversifying your investor base. It's a question of keeping your existing investors because your investors have moved from ESG equal nice to have to ESG equal must have. And that, that's, that's a change completely. So what we do, uh, we, we are the global leader in ESG bonds and uh, in particular out of Dublin, um, uh, the ESG bond segment and, and, and the commitment uh, uh, for, for the UN uh, uh, Global Compact Blue Bond Reference Paper is a very important part in this respect. Um, we are um, uh, doing a lot in terms of ESG indices because the indices are the best way to convey market information and to, to identify synthetic uh, group, group of companies. Actually, 80% of all the, all the indices we have released last year and the previous year are ESG-driven indices. And uh, we spend a lot of time in uh, financial literacy and we, we have a, a joint venture with a, a, a partnership with uh, GA Europe to, to help uh, kids in, in, in uh, high schools across Europe to build blue economy type of projects. And, uh, and so on and so forth. So I think we can do a lot, but, but just by using the fundamental pillars and engines of, uh, of, of, of finance. That's why Euronext is, is so uh, committed to that transformation of capitalism, because at the end of the day, there are two words that none of us has learned at university or has heard at university, when, when, when at least when I was young and slim at university, uh, the, the first one is negative interest rates and the other one is ESG. I mean, none of us uh, 20 or, or 30 years ago for the old man on this call uh, had, had even thought that we would be one day uh, spending uh, uh, time uh, discussing uh, what we can do to, to, to protect nature. That, that was for others, not for us. And, uh, and this is the probably most fundamental transformation of, uh, of, of capitalism, and it is to last. And, 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 and that's that and, and, and finance has always been a very, very powerful to implement transformation of, uh, of uh, market economy. I mean, the only alternative option is we, if we all move to an administrative economy and then, then we not only we have no job and then all the discussions become pointless. But as long as we believe that this is the best way to allocate resources to collective preferences, uh, that that will be the most powerful uh, vector to implement uh, uh, those transformations. That's really, really helpful. Thank you, Stefan. And, and I thought your, 
your um, an analogy that actually nature is a is a real gateway into understanding climate was a was a really interesting one, and uh, and I think it's very very true as you say, climate can seem a little bit esoteric, but nature is actually absolutely happening all around us, and if we paying low attention to what's going on locally, uh, then potentially we can see changes, both good ones and, and bad ones. So, Siobhan, Odile, I wanted to sort of uh, throw it over to you. I don't know whether either of you wants to, to add anything to, to what we've been discussing so far in terms of uh, really motivating uh, the, the financial sector to, to take action, um, whether from either of your perspectives, there's anything that we should be thinking about in the near term, maybe. Mm. Perhaps just some words because a lot have been said. I would like just to say that when I was young, I was still working on ecology. And <laughs> <laughs> so that was also the case. But I really, and that was not so, not so um, clear uh, in the um, perhaps ecological world uh, that the finance could have a role. I always thought that it could be the case and always push in different type of uh, companies where I worked. And now to see both together, that's really, really, really good because I completely agree with Stefan. And as I said, also in the introduction, the, the financial sector has a real power to make things evolve. So uh, a lot have been said, I would say, um, there is perhaps a difference between the pioneers that we hear today and that we very often hear and uh, a lot of financial institutions in other part of the world, which uh, perhaps are, have less knowledge of what they can do not a question of willingness but a, a question of feasibility and implementation uh, we we receive calls very often saying well we would like to but what can we do so uh, as as it was said before but there is a power of examples and uh, peer uh, exchanges and so on is uh, is really important not only in events but concretely on the ground what can be done and uh, and the partnerships also when when we look carefully at the perhaps the pioneers here in Europe and uh, in other countries, very often they are working with <coughs> with NGOs, uh, with scientists, and so on, explaining first what it is biodiversity, what we are trying to do, and uh, and not only what it is, uh, but uh, how they can deal with that, what they can finance, where is there a market or not, because that's mainly the market first, uh, and the risk uh, also, and uh, that has to be explained perhaps more, and such partnership can also be interesting, and that's a way also to link these different worlds. It's not easy. They don't speak the same language, very often they don't understand each other. We saw that with CBD negotiators, but nevertheless, that's one of the key of the success also to work together. So a need of uh, a global framework is absolutely important to know where we have to go all and uh, it's sure that we won't surely not have the 1.5 degree for biodiversity. Uh, we, we can think it's a pity because the financial sector is asking for that uh, but nevertheless it will give some uh, perhaps two three four goals uh, and uh, and the good hopefully direction where where to go we need, if I come back to the GBF and for to push also and mobilize the financial sector um, to have perhaps more references in the global biodiversity framework and clear references uh, to the financial sector and to what they, they can do. It's perhaps not completely the case now, but it's not finished. So there are some references, uh, but it has to be clear. It's, it's drafted with the worlds of the ecological community and not the financial ones and um, so partnership examples global framework accessible to the financial community and i would say also the link when i think above all to to the developing countries the link to the social um, issues uh, and climate sure climate that's sure uh, for the financial community but do not forget the social issues with this idea of development to not make this opposition that we so often hear yes okay but uh, we have poor people we have to look at them and biodiversity is after that and it's not true <laughs> it's not true because uh, because it's completely linked and uh, the poorest population suffer much more than the others of the loss of biodiversity so in the way to think about it also, and with the examples both, and with climate have to be linked also. And really I, want, awesome. yeah. Yeah, I want to speak again of data, targets, metrics, and so on, because, uh, and taxonomy, uh, and all the need of tools and so on, We everyone is saying that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you, no, that's really helpful. 
Siobhan, we've uh, we've got sort of literally a, a minute or so left, but I, I did want to give you the the, the final word. So, um, what would you like to add to to what's been already been said? Well, I think what I'd like to do is pick out um, the sort of key messages which I heard coming out, which is that there are already things that the finance sector can start doing. So there is action they can start taking now. Um, they can already start to understand their exposures, their portfolio exposures, and therefore the impacts that they are currently financing, even if it's somewhat messy. They can already start to engage companies on directionally correct actions that companies could and should be taking. So the interim targets that I spoke of earlier. And um, there are any number of convening organizations that are providing the finance community with opportunities to learn from one another um, about how best to get to grips with this issue. So UNPRI, UN Principles for Responsible Banking, UN Principles for Sustainable Insurance, the Finance for Biodiversity Foundation, the Finance for Biodiversity Initiative is doing a great deal of work on understanding various transition risk pathways and and providing frameworks for thinking about these things, there is absolutely no excuse for a finance institution not to start taking action on this now. Thank you. Yeah, that's uh, that's a, a very a very good summary uh, of our discussion. And I think that the fact that yes, it's, it may be difficult, but actually it's very urgent and uh, and really important for financial institutions to engage in uh, right at this very moment is is absolutely key. Um, it's been fantastic to to be able to be part of, uh, of such a, an erudite discussion. Thank you so much to uh, to all my panelists. Um, you've contributed a, a huge amount, and uh, it will be really really good to to go back and and sort of listen again to some of the points that have been made. But I think the the fact that, as you were saying, Stefan, that you know it's it's really understanding that that local impact and getting that sort of tangible experience of what's going on can be a, a tremendous way to then expand that uh, across the whole financial markets. And, and as Simon and, and Adil were both sort of illustrating the fact that it's it's within financial institutions graphs to, to do things now in terms of some measurement, some use of science-based sort of targets uh, is, is good enough to examine whether you are actively causing harm or funding harm, or whether actually the way that you're allocating your capital and indeed um, engaging with companies and fulfilling your so important stewardship obligations. Uh, that is also absolutely essential and clearly a key part of the path going forward. So, so once again, thank you very much indeed for all my panelists. Um, thanks, Anthony, for sort of um, getting this together and, uh, and facilitating this event. It's been a privilege to be part of it. Um, and thank you so much for all the work that you're doing and, and the very best of luck with each and every one of your endeavors going forward. Anthony, thank you. Thank you, Peter, for moderating the session. And thank you to all the speakers uh, for joining us today. A lot of issues were raised today that we look forward to following up uh, with you in the future. Um, and so this concludes this session. Uh, but thank you all for tuning in. And uh, again, thank you to all our speakers for joining. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.